I'm going to be talking about a very exciting trend in the construction industry, and that's mass timber and how it's applied to large and, and tall buildings. I'm going to be looking at sort of the, the uh, building blocks, the uh, structural building blocks of those buildings, how we produce them, the technology that's applied to them. And uh, then I'm going to pass it over to Russell, and he's going to drill. He's going to look at this specific building that's up in the screen right now, which is the Brock Common Students Residence at UBC. Very exciting. Okay. How do we do this thing? A little bit about Structure Lamb before I go on. So Structure Lamb has been in business for 55 years. We're based in Penticton, BC. Uh, we have three plants in the South Okanagan, and we employ about 180 people there. We're also the largest manufacturer of mass timber elements in North America. So I'm not going to dwell on the forest industry. Everybody here, I know, everybody here, I think, knows the importance of it to the British Columbia economy. It represents more than a third of all of our exports. Um, what's important is the last one, and that's that uh, all of our forests here in BC are managed sustainably, and Structure Lamb only sources uh, our product from sustainable managed forests in British Columbia. And by sustainable, I'm talking about not only the level of harvest, I'm also talking about protecting the other values of the forest resource, like water, like wildlife habitat and recreation opportunities. We do a good job. But it goes past the, sustain the sustainable management of our forest lands here into the wood products arena. So here, life cycle takes on a, a meaning and uh, as you can tell, when we go from manufacturing to use and eventually to reuse or recycle, wood products uh, fare very well against the other materials from a life cycle perspective. And here, is frankly a pile of, of uh, captured carbon. Let me tell you, that that's the Brock Commons building there and uh, Russell will walk you through that one. So three key takeaways from the few minutes that I have up here for you is that understand it, that uh, carbon mitigation is more than just the managing of our forest. It's really what do we do with the wood that comes from that forest. And one of the best things you can do with that wood to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions is to capture that carbon in a mass timber element. I also want to talk about how mass timber technology has the potential to tra transform the construction industry. I believe it's happening already. I think as you look into the future, you're going to see a lot more large wood structures. And I also want to talk about some of the technology that we apply to it, because some of the materials we use have been around a long time. But now we're uh, using brand new technology to use things that, with wood that have never been done or couldn't have been done even as short as 15 or 20 years ago. So what does Structure Lamb do? What are these building blocks that I'm talking about? We manufacture glue laminated uh, beams and columns and we manufacture cross laminated timber panels. So if you want to know what a glue lamb beam is, you go out the door and you look up because uh, we have all glue lamb beams up in the ceiling here at the convention center. Or if you wanted to see bigger uh, versions of that, check out the Olympic Oval. Our beams are uh, spanning across that. We make them straight, we make them curved, we make them up to 120 feet long and, uh, and up to eight and a half feet deep. So the gulam gets uh, pretty sizable uh, when we're done. We also, um, you can see some of the machining and I'm gonna talk about that that happens after the gulam billet is created. So gulam beams, basically you're taking lumber and you're, you're uh, 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 gluing layer after layer to make it up. Lamb stock it's called. When you, uh, when you, when you look at cross laminated timber panels, it's slightly different. Here we're laying the lumber longitudinally and then we're going 90 degrees to that at the next layer and then another 90 degrees. So we go crop back and forth. We don't make a beam or a column. We end up with a very large panel that's up to 40 feet long and 10 feet wide. A simple way to think about it is our glue line beams re replace steel and our CLT panels replace concrete. So here's a CLT panel. And so once you've made this panel, now we, what we do is we apply prefabrication technology to it. So the buildings that we do, the projects that we do, they're essentially fabricated in our plant, one of our plants in Penticton, and then shipped to site. They're all prefabricated buildings, really. Here's a CLT on the uh, CNC robot uh, pad. So that what's happening here is the, uh, sorry, it's a CLT on this, with the CNC robot um, uh, machining it. So what, how do we get to this point? How does that machine know what to do? So what we do is we model that building. We use, we use uh, CAD CAM technology. We use model that building in a computer. We essentially build the building right in virtually inside the computer. Every detail goes into that model. Every connection, every wood to wood connection, every wood to steel or concrete connections in there, every bolt, not everything is in that model. Once that model is approved, we take that file 
and we download it into that CNC machine. So, and that's what cuts the parts out for the buildings that we, uh, we, we uh, create. You know, that, and that's changed dramatically in the last 15 or 20 years. If you'd come to Structure Lamb in the 1990s, you would have seen Italians and Germans and, and maybe Portuguese, real craftsmen that were, came over to, from Canada after World War II, and they were amazingly talented uh, um, craftsmen that could do this, this kind of stuff. Well, they, we, don't, we don't have those guys anymore. They're retired or gone, and so we've replaced them with technology and taken it to a whole new level. So here's mass timber construction in, and a great example of it. This is a, uh, this one, I, this picture we took um, last week in Penticton. It's the new hotel that's going up right on the lakeshore, Penticton Lakeside Resort. And here you can see the Gulam beams up in the ceiling supporting the CLTs on the roof. And then you can see the Gulam columns. And here the architect has specified exposed CLTs for walls between the suites in the, uh, in the hotel. So, a fantastic example of what we can do now in a large building. This one's six stories tall, and uh, and it's going to be uh, finished here in a, in a ready to open up in the beginning of June. All prefabricated at our labs at our uh, factories in Penticton. So that's an example of a large and tall building that we can do, and that's very exciting for us. Here's a, a uh, here's what else we can do with our uh, CNC technology, and that's this one here is on the corner of Seymour and and Georgia, it's the Telus Gardens building. And you can see what we're doing with this uh, uh, canopy here. Those arches are, are shaped in a V shape. They taper from the bottom to the top and they curve all at the same time. So if you can imagine the complexity of the geometry of that, um, things we couldn't done in the past, but it's pretty impressive now. There's not much we can't do with, uh, with wood now. This is the most complicated building we ever did. It's, uh, it's a few years old now. It's the Art Gallery of Ontario. It run, this facade runs one block in the downtown uh, Toronto. Uh, and the interesting thing about this, designed by Frank Gehry, and it was, uh, every, it's 7,000 wood elements in it, no two are the same. So that's about as complicated as it gets. We also do a, still do a fair bit of residential. On the left-hand side, you can see Gulam Beams. That's on a house in Salt Spring Island that was done with uh, yellow cedar. And on the right-hand side, that's a house in, um, in Seattle. And here they, the owner asked us to use our CNC machines to actually cut out the designs in the CLT panels, and then we glass that in. Looks pretty cool. So I'll bring it back to BC a little bit because this really is a British Columbia success story, what we're doing here. Um, we are building world-class buildings, guys. There's no, absolutely no doubt about it. We're using fiber from British Columbia, some of the best fiber in the world, by the way. We're using BC labor, BC manufacturing, and BC designers to create these buildings. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic story. And in hopefully, as it continues down the road, and I think wood construction continues to grow, we'll see more and more of these wood buildings uh, come on stream. And it might, even, it might even change our supply chain a little bit. Instead of exporting dimensional lumber, two by sixes and two by eights, maybe we'll be exporting in the future um, mass timber buildings. Just a little bit before I go about um, carbon sequestration, as, as I mentioned, uh, I want to talk about the benefits of mass timber. I talked about carbon sequestration. I think that um, Russell will talk a little bit about how, the, how Grot Commons went up. Truly incredibly fast construction because everything is prefabricated in the factory down to millimeters in accuracy. It comes off the truck and it's installed immediately and the buildings go up fast. Um, there's no waste on site. Uh, there is none. If you uh, had a chance to go to Brock Commons or any of these mass timber buildings that are going up, you'll see a very, very clean construction site. Yes, there's waste at our plant, which we then grind up and we burn it in our, in our biomass heaters, boilers, and we heat our plants with it. Another advantage is that we can use underutilized species. Mountain pine beetle is just one of them. Um, we've got, still got a lot here in British Columbia, but other, other species that aren't typically get used very much, we can put them in a CLT, in that CLT core. And if the architect wants to expose it, we can put anything we, they want on the outside layer. And finally, there's a lot of studies out there that have shown that wood buildings are very uh, uh, friendly in terms of health and well-being for human beings, and uh, just wood buildings have a better feel to them. And that's why the architect here that did, I uh, um, oh, forgot the name of it now. Help me, guys. <laughs> Ronald McDonald House used, uh, used wood for this one. This is the new Ronald McDonald House in Vancouver. 
So I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to pass it over to Russell, and, uh, and he's gonna, he is the designer of the world's tallest wood building. So, Russell? Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, so we'll just uh, figure out how the button works here. Um, yeah, Brock Commons uh, Tallwood House is an 18-story, 53-meter-high student residence. It's currently under construction out at the UBC Point Grey campus. Uh, this first-of-its-kind building moved from concept to construction in just 10 months' time. And last summer, over a nine-week period, Brock Commons became the tallest contemporary masswood building in the world. And more important is that Brock Commons demonstrates that environmentally sustainable mass wood structures can be affordable to design and build. So I'm going to start things off with a short time lapse video that's uh, produced by uh, Naturally Wood. And there's going to be lots of facts and figures, so you're going to have to pay attention. Um, Construction began last year on June 6th and was completed in just 66 days. Are we up and running here? <laughs> Sorry. There we go. There we go. So week one, the structure uh, just took a nine-man crew to, to put this whole thing up. Now, here we are at week two. There's uh, 78 wood columns per floor. That's 1,302 columns total. Week three, uh, the columns, they measure 265 by 265 millimeters, kind of the same size as you would have for concrete in a similar applica application. Week four, it takes about five to 10 minutes to install each one of these columns, and they're placed by uh, hand or crane, depending on location. Here we are at week five. Two levels are erected per week, and that includes the columns, the CLT panels, and um, the prefab facade. Week six, uh, 29 CLT panels per floor, 464 panels total. Here at week seven, uh, the panels, they measure six, eight, 10, and 12 meters in length. They're about three meters wide. They're five ply and they're about uh, 169 millimeters thick. I shouldn't say about, dead on. Week eight, 22 prefab facade panels per floor. They go up shortly after the floors and there's 374 of those in total. Here we are, week nine. That's a, you've just seen this building grow, 18 stories. Completion, just over 2,233 cubic meters of renewable wood used, which Canadian and US forests replenished in just six minutes. And the total project carbon benefit is 2,432 metric tons of CO2. And that's equivalent to removing about 511 cards from the road for one year. So for reasons of economy, fire protection, and the approvals process, again, being the first of its kind here, the wood structure is covered in gypsum board. And this drawing shows the mass wood structure on the left with its gypsum encapsulation on the right. And also due to the project being the first of its kind, approval to construct the project had to be obtained from a provincial authority. And this is the hybrid structural system, concrete, wood, and steel. The first level and two cores are concrete, above which there are 17 floors of wood columns and the CLT panels. And steel drag straps are fixed to the top of the CLT and it's used to transfer seismic forces to the concrete cores. And the roof structure is actually made out of steel. We just use the materials that make sense in each application. So a key feature of the Masswood technology is the large scale use of a two-way span CLT flat plate slab. This actually hadn't been done in this scale in the, in the world uh, uh, before. What it does is it eliminates the use of beams uh, in the structure. CLT is 169 millimeters thick, as I said, and five plies. It's really kind of a type of super plywood. And this full-size testing of the CLT panels was performed out at the FP Innovations Lab at UBC. This is the steel connector detail that kind of brings everything together. It's simple, practical, and economical. The connect connectors are epoxied onto the glue lamb columns that happened in, um, in Bill's shop. 
holes in the CLT panels are guided onto the threaded steel rods that you see at the top of the column and then they're bolted into place. And the base connector is just slid into the upper connector and is fastened with a steel pin. Uh, Bill mentioned manufacturing, erection tolerances are very, very tight. The glue lamp columns and CLT panels are made to plus or minus two millimeter tolerance and they're positioned within plus or minus two millimeters. You never hear this type of tolerance in, um, in large scale construction. And this is a view through the CLT panel and column connection. And again, maybe I'm just an architect, but I can't overstate the simplicity and pure beauty of this structural system. This shows the final finished uh, assembly of the system. And here you can see these are uh, two freestanding 18 story concrete cores that were constructed prior to the start of the mass wood erection. I think these things took like six months on their own and then nine weeks for the wood that followed. So this is the first level of the wood columns installed on the concrete transfer slab. Again, positioned within two millimeters tolerance. Here, this is one of the first of the CLT panels being raised into position. Not only glue lamp columns, but we also had high strength parallel columns that were used at the center of the lower levels due to the high compressive loads at that location. Here it takes six to 12 minutes to install each of the CLT panels. And this includes the lifting and the travel time by crane. Here you can see the site looks quiet and that's really because only the nine workers were needed to erect the mass wood structure. And here the workers are guiding the CLT panels onto the threaded rods of the steel connector. And here's a newly installed CLT deck. And you can see there's a bit of a low tech installation tech being brought to bear on the high tech wood panels. Just can't take some of the construction out of construction. Uh, moving up here, I see Bill and I both like this photo. CLT panel being raised up against the backdrop of those prefab facade panels I'd mentioned. And here these are CLT panels. They're being installed up on the 16th floor. Again, a CLT panel, 12 meters long, about 2.85 meters wide. It's being installed against the spectacular scenic backdrop out at Brock Commons. This video shows how high tech meets low tech when it comes to erection of the glue, glue lamp columns. You can see they're just heaved up, dropped into the steel connector and then fixed in place with a steel pin. That's it. Here's a completed level of the mass wood structure. As I mentioned earlier, over 2,200 cubic meters of wood was used on the project with a total carbon benefit of over 2,400 metric tons of CO2. And the cladding on the prefab facade panels is Trespa, which is made up of 70% wood fibers. Some of that good old wood fiber that uh, Bill mentions. So this is made in Belgium, so I don't know if it's BC. And uh, thermosetting resins. And here a six-man crew takes eight hours to install 22 prefab facade panels at each floor. So Brock Commons is demonstrating that mass wood technology can truly make an impact on the environment. However, to be environmentally meaningful mass wood technology must be used on buildings of all types and sizes. Brock Commons it aspires to be a model for mass wood of the commonplace the affordable, the buildable. Brock Commons really aspires to be a genuine game changer in the building industry. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that in a not too distant future, our cities will feature extraordinarily ordinary mass wood buildings for the masses, simply because sustainable and renewable mass wood buildings make sense. Thanks. And I know it's that time of the afternoon where you might have the uh, temptation to nod off. So I have to warn you right off the start, there'll be a quiz at the end of the presentation. So that's the bad news. The good news is the quiz is up on the screen. It's a very simple question. 
and I'm hoping that to go on a journey that might change your perspective on what you see when you look at our forests. So I've been in the forest industry for about 35 years, and I've been in the concentrated clean tech sector for about two or three. And my view of the forest has changed significantly. Uh, as all commodities, there's good days and bad days, and no matter how good or bad the days are in the forest industry, the sun seems to come up the next day. And if you're not in Vancouver, you'll notice that the sun has this irradiance to it. It's got this warmth. And um, if you think back to your grade nine science, and you think about photosynthesis, and you think about the forest, we've got water, we've got CO2, we've got plants, there's trees, there's forest, and we create oxygen, and everybody's happy. So from a simplistic point of view, you might look at the forest and say, it's an air purifier. You might say it's a carbon sequestering device. You might say, wow, because we maintain our biodiversity and our practices, it's a recreational enhancer. If you get your chemical engineering geek on, you start talking about things like stoichiometry, you might look at the forest and say, where well, there's six moles of CO2, there's six moles of water, plus the energy of the sun, and it changes into this compound. C6H12O6. If you're a chemist, you'd say, well, that's a carbohydrate. And you'd look at the forest and say, it is a collection of stretched triangles that contain buckets of chemicals. So you start to look at the forest a little differently now. And if you're in the clean tech renewable energy uh, power sector, you might talk about solar, you might talk about run of river, and you might talk about wind. And you would fully understand that nobody knows when it's gonna rain, nobody knows when wind's gonna blow, and nobody knows when the sun's gonna shine, especially here in Vancouver. But here's the neat thing. If you work for BC Hydro, you could start to look at the forest differently. You might look at the tree and say, the branches are really solar panels, and the trunk of the tree is a deep solar storage battery. And really, if I worked for BC Hydro, I'd look at the forest and I'd say, this is a non-firm to firm energy converting device. So, and if I'm in the hydrogen industry, I might say, boy, this is a hydrogen storage device because it's taken that hydrogen from the water. It's not using fossil fuel, but it's generating hydrogen. So, get more into the conventional side of forestry. Uh, we use transportation fuels and um, we work well with the oil sector in northern BC and northern Alberta. We bring in conventional crude. We use the two refineries in BC. We make diesel, we make gasoline, and that allows us to transport these deep solar storage batteries. It also allows us to go and plant three new trees for every tree we harvest to make sure that our industry is sustainable. We just talked about tall wood buildings, so we get dimensional lumber, which enables that. Uh, we take the residuals from sawmills, and uh, really what we do is we make logs into micro logs, we call it pellets. We generally ship this offshore where other jurisdictions recognize the forest differently and uh, provide policy that incense pellets. The residuals also go into the world that I've worked in for many years, it's pulp and paper. And we also use that residual wood to generate electricity, a lot of electricity. We've improved our energy efficiency in our mills to the point where we're not only electrically self-sufficient, we also have excess power that we put onto the grid. And um, when you think about how other people recognize the forest, we've reduced our, our carbon footprint to the point where the NHL buys carbon offsets off of camphor pulp, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Other than for me, I, I, it really pains me to think that we're helping the Edmonton Oiler franchise in any way, shape, or form. But uh, other people, even indirectly, are recognizing the forest differently. So this is where the, the forest industry sits today. And we looked and said, well, what technology do we apply here? So this is what I want to... Uh, talk about now. So we could speed the pulp mill up and make more electricity. Uh, the province is long on power. The globe is starting to become long on power. There's negative energy rates 
in Germany at times because all the renewables. So maybe there's a different pathway that we need to look for in wood. So if we speed up our pulp mill and create residuals and we start to look at conventional crude, when you think about that carbohydrate, that compound, that chemical bucket in a tree and you start to connect the dots, we've now taken the tree in solid form, added some energy to it, and it's now in liquid form in the pulp mill. So you can do a lot more with the liquid if you're a chemical engineer than you can a solid. So if we were to take that molecule and remove the oxygen and add a couple of hydrogens, you start to understand that it becomes very similar to the generic nomenclature for conventional crude. So we did a, a, did a wide word, uh, worldwide inventory of technologies of folks that are in the space. Uh, we saw a company in Australia called Lysella that was trying to take brown coal, successfully doing it, and they were turning it into metallurgical coal and turning it into crude oil. The only problem was brown coal is not renewable. It takes the earth a long time to generate it. So we did trials with them, sent them waste streams from the pulp mill, and it turns out that it was a perfect fit. A perfect fit. And so we've been working with them, and at this point, uh, we've produced um, a little sample of it here, an 85% carbon intensity reduced bio crude. So you could see crude oil with very exact chemistry as what uh, nature produces going into our refineries in BC. We would work with the petrochemical industry rather than creating a drop in end fuel and going into competition. They like this because they get to maximize their, their investment. They already have the retail chain in place. So now they're just gonna create diesel, they're gonna create diesel uh, gasoline, they can create jet fuel, and uh, we can really create this cycle in the forest industry here in BC that's truly renewable. In fact, I would say you can make good argument that the industry would become carbon negative. I've grossly oversimplified the chemistry in wood, and, and there's, all, there's actually a lot of complex cyclical compounds, and refineries today make 80% of their revenue from non-fuel outcomes. Anything from food additives to cosmetics um, to plastic precursors. Think if you could green up polypropylene and those types of compounds, and they could come from a tree. We don't want to go into competition with the folks that are already doing this. We want to utilize the assets that they have, and quite frankly, our assets. So when you start to look at this infinite loop and you start to think about sustainability, uh, at CAM4 Pulp, our motto or our slogan for sustainability is create more value with less impact. And this cycle starts to become pretty compelling. So in this space of advanced biofuels, it's really about oxygen and hydrogen. So it's about densifying energy. Nature's done a great job. It took biomass and the presence of salt water, lava flow, and it, it got rid of the oxygen. And so crude oil is about 45 megajoules per kilogram, 0% oxygen. It's all carbon hydrogen. Wood can be up to 55% by weight oxygen. So the challenge is how do you take the oxygen off and put hydrogen on and not use fossil fuel to create the hydrogen. We want to get it from water. And so in a 30-minute reactor, we've got it a long ways there, and the refiners have said to us, with these characteristics, they can blend it at at least 5% in any of the refineries. So what's the technology? So CAD-HTR, it's cat catalytic hydrothermal reacting, which is basically taking this stream, this slurry, um, and taking it to near supercritical pressures and temperatures. What happens is water becomes a reactant. It switches polarity, it acts as a solvent, and all of a sudden oils that used to be hydrophobic become hydrophilic. And you absorb the oils into the water in these pressurized vessels, and then you release the pressure, and the oil separates from the water. The key piece here, when you look at a lot of the technologies, you ha usually have to dry the biomass first. That takes a lot of energy. 
This process likes water, in fact, enhances it and it creates water. Um, the oil is stable, meaning you can store it for a long time, and it's pH neutral. So why does that matter? Well, why that matters is most refineries are built with a carbon steel front end. So if you give them a pyrolysis or a gasification type oil, that's a two and a half pH, they have to retrofit the whole front end of their refinery. They're not gonna like you. They like this crude oil. I'm just gonna make one more point on this slide. This process mirrors what already happens in our craft pulp mills. It's just now that we're gonna operate these reactor vessels at higher pressures and temperatures. So when you look at a pulp mill as a platform and you look at the expertise we have in our people, you look at our environmental systems and our abilities to handle high pressures and temperatures, because we've been doing it for a long time, it is the perfect platform for this technology. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because uh, others have covered it, but you know when you start getting into the sector, you look at things different. I was in the Air Canada Lounge and I saw this magazine caught my eye, uh, eye as corporate nights, a vote for climate change. And um, the Netherlands is uh, looking to increase forest cover by 25%. They're gonna reforestate 100,000 hectares. They're recognized, that's noble, it's small. When you look at it on BC scale even, never mind Canada, but the reality is our forest industry has a great impact already when it comes to climate change. And if you think about a company like Camphor, in 2015, we planted 78 million trees. And hopefully by now you might be saying we planted 78 million solar devices. So one last example here when you look at the forest, Derek actually talked a lot about the fact that we've had infestations in our forests, right? So if you think about a solar device that the solar panels malfunction, but you have fully charged solar batteries, what do you have? If you're from BC, you might know this term, you have a beetle kilt forest. So eventually those logs get spiral cracking and they're no longer merchantable for saw logs. So today those logs are falling over in the forest and they become ant food. And when they become ant food, they emit methane. When you look at climate uh, change page from Environment Canada, methane's much worse than CO2. So we have forests that are gonna have life cycles. Uh, you know, I've lived in Prince George for a while, tree planted for a long time, so I've been in the forest and I challenge foresters all the time and I say, from Prince George to the coastal mountains, how many times do you see a tree with more than 100 rings? They say, not very often. When I say 120, they almost say never. So the fact is we didn't have mass forestry in central BC 100 or 125 years ago, but the forest had devastation back then. It had to have. So there's these cycles that we have in the forest and we need to have another tool in our tool pouch, my view in forestry, to be able to use the forest in all stages of its uh, growth and, and quite frankly, its death and um, really taking it and making an advanced biofuel. If you're looking at it as a bucket of chemicals, not a structural device, you can still use it. And we can use species that we're not using today to enhance the utilization of our forests. So I'm just gonna make a couple points here to wrap up. And um, one is, I think it's very obvious that strong climate policy and economic prosperity don't have to be mutually exclusive. BC, the energy, Ministry of Energy and Mines has a very good low carbon fuel standard that's enabling us to do this in BC. And we think that our pathway is not only gonna create jobs in the, the advanced green industry, but it's also gonna sustain jobs, high value jobs in the forest sector and also in the petrochemical industry. So I think that's really important when you look at this technology. So in the end, uh, we're starting to look at the forest a little bit different, and uh, hopefully over this few minutes that we spent, uh, if you were asked that question about what do you see when you look at the forest, you might have a little bit of a different perspective. So thanks for your attention.
so before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the students, um, colleagues, and industry partners that have helped in developing the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, uh, lots of folks from Thompson Rivers University as well as UBC and University of Guelph um, and are my industry partners. I'm going to talk about three case studies. I'm going to take you to three mines today. Um, the Mount Pauly mine up near uh, Likely, uh, not Likely, uh, yeah, Likely. Um, the uh, Highland Valley Copper Mine near Logan Lake uh, and New Afton Mine uh, near Kamloops. And the, uh, the first case study I'm going to talk about is uh, the uh, Mount Pauly Mine. Uh, on August uh, 4th, uh, 2014, as you're probably uh, all well aware, uh, there was a uh, mine tailings breach. And we happened to uh, be starting a project up at the Mount Pauly Mine. Um, we were going to be looking at uh, using passive treatment wetland systems to, to treat uh, mine-influenced uh, wastewater. And so we had an ongoing partnership uh, with Mount Pauly and uh, the mine um, had, uh, the tailings facility had a breach. So we were there on site, uh, very rapidly able to uh, respond to this, this accident. Um, and what you see here is, uh, is a map of the site. The dark gray is, is the footprint of the mine um, and the Pink is the bre breach impact area where uh, the tailings came out and um, it, they ran into Polly Lake, which, uh, which you can see surrounded by yellow dots, down Hazeltine Creek in, in red dots, and into Quinnell Lake. Um, and so our first response was to develop monitoring stations. And we set up uh, each of these dots represents uh, 60 monitoring stations. Uh, where we took samples um, to assess the impact uh, that the, the, uh, the, the breach had on the uh, natural environment. Um, the uh, lake to the far left of the screen is uh, Bootjack Lake, and that is our reference undisturbed site. Um, the figure on the left here uh, shows the substrate material. Our first step in this process um, was to separate and s and, uh, the different uh, substrate materials from each of these locations, um, depending on whether they were uh, tailings, uh, whether it was uh, organics, uh, mineral, uh, and what the constituency of, of these, uh, these sites were. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of variation. Um, and some, some sites were straight tailings, uh, whereas, of course, others were more organic in nature. And the figure on the right uh, is a, uh, it's a um, mu multiple uh, variable ordination that shows you the, uh, the, the, uh, the points that are closer together are more tightly correlated uh, using uh, multivariate uh, regressions. And you can see that there's good separation with uh, Polly Lake in green and uh, the uh, uh, Quinell Lake uh, in, in orange. Uh, where we see a great separation on the right is Hazeltine Creek. And Hazeltine Creek was mostly um, uh, tailings sediment. And so we take our next step in determining the microbial community. And this is where we use uh, genetic sequencing technologies. Uh, and the figure on the left shows the separation and segregation of the major phylums of bacteria that we uh, determined uh, through DNA sequencing. You can see that there's a host of different bacteria. They all serve r different roles in, in the community. Um, and they separate out according to the different sites uh, that we sampled from. Um, and on the far left, um, where we see the percentage, uh, where we see the acidobacteria and actinobacteria, 
you'll notice that um, Quinell Lake is, is most dominant in those bacterial forms. And those two uh, phylum of bacteria are very important in ecological processes, decomposition. Um, then when we look at Hazeltine, as you recall from the last slide, uh, that was a highly disturbed area. And, uh, Hazeltine uh, Creek is showing up uh, with a dominance um, of the, um, uh, uh, the Euro uh, Chaota, which is the chemolithic uh, bacteria. And one of the main species, uh, and this is where we look to the figure on the right, is Thiobacillus. Um, this is a strong indicator species of disturbed sites. And what this is showing us is that the microbial communities are responding to these disturbances. Um, we find in this disturbed location um, a high dominance of thiobacillus, um, and that's demonstrating that these bacteria are performing a, a, a role which they should be. Um, so this was uh, confirming um, that the bacteria play an important role in these disturbed systems. Uh, so now we'll go uh, to um, Highland Valley Copper Mine, where we've had a long-term study looking at the role of biosolids in ecosystem reclamation. Uh, biosolids is uh, treated uh, sewage and uh, biosolids have been used uh, for decades um, in various uh, roles. They're high, highly organic. Uh, they're also high in uh, nutrients and nitrogen, and they've been used as a fertilizer source. Um, there are very few, however, um, long-term studies of the eff efficacy of using biosolids. Um, and this plot was developed in 1999, close to 20 years ago. Um, and there's been uh, some suggestions that uh, long-term use of biosolids may encourage non-desirable species. And so we were able to follow up with this project and look at the study site um, currently to look at the species composition of the grasses as well as to look at other factors, carbon sequestration being a major one. And you can see the study site and where there's a lot of abundant growth is where is the study plots where there was more biosolids applied. And often um, uh, statistics is not needed. When you look at, at the results here, you can see that with our control sites where there were no biosolids applied after uh, 15 years at this point, um, there is still no plant growth. With 250 tons per hectare, there's abundant uh, plant growth. But we can see that growth uh, above ground. Um, what is really important is looking at how that growth is relayed below ground as well. Um, and the root uh, in, of the uh, biosolids applied plant, uh, plant material is, is highly diverse and abundant. And I want to emphasize here that this was a one-time application of biosolids um, in 1999, a one-time application. And so we can now look at uh, how these treatments uh, relate in terms of plant productivity on the left. Um, and when we apply more biosolids, uh, they doesn't really increase the amount of plant productivity. 150 to, compared to 250 were, were the same amount. However, when we analyze the below ground soil carbon, we do see that the higher application of biosolids rates increases the percentage of soil carbon in the soils. And this actually relates to uh, a significant um, sequestration of soil carbon in these systems. And now we can start thinking about uh, the importance of this as a process in terms of balancing carbon rates um, within, within environments, but also within the mining industry. Um, this can be considered a potential trade-off. 
Okay, so the, uh, the final case study is, uh, is uh, going to take us to New Afton mine uh, near Kamloops. Often, you know, when we think about restoration, and this has been historical in context, the idea has been that we develop a plant community and uh, we're good. Um, we green the site up and we can, we can walk away. But we're beginning to understand, of course, we understand completely that ecosystems are very complex. Um, and there's, uh, there are food webs involved, there is energy flow from one trophic level to the next, and sometimes uh, these controls can run not only bottom, from the bottom up, from primary producers to the top consumers, but also top down. And so in order to plan for ecosystem restoration, we need to understand the whole ecosystem, which is understanding the biodiversity of the community which is very challenging to do. And so we also can use uh, proxies or indicator species. And invertebrates are a, a very good indicator species of biodiversity in terrestrial systems because they're one of the bottom uh, food webs. And a lot of the energy of ecosystems flows through the invertebrate level. And yet using um, you know, historic taxonomic uh, morphology characteristics to identify species is time consuming and you require experts in order to do that. Um, new tools have been developed using DNA barcoding um, by selecting uh, a, a, a very uh, unique portion um, of the, the genome of animals, which is in this case within the mitochondria, um, has been found to be very significantly unique by species. Um, and so by analyzing those 600 base pairs, we can develop essentially these barcodes to identify species. And this has increased tremendously our ability to very quickly, efficiently, and accurately estimate the number of species on site. And at New Afton Mine, uh, a pilot project was initiated some three years ago, and uh, about 50,000 individuals were identified, and uh, it represented around uh, 1,700 species of invertebrate, which is an incredible thing because it allows us to develop benchmarks um, for uh, for, for recovery of these systems. Um, and so the barcoding program was set up at New Afton and we use these uh, malaise traps, these insect, uh, they capture flying invertebrates. And we're going to extend this to other, other mines and build what John was talking about right at the beginning of this session, developing these collaboratives, these uh, working together in partnership. Uh, so to conclude, um, mine reclamation is a rapidly advancing field. And we've uh, shown that through monitoring um, and sequestration of heavy metals in mine tailings, we can use microbial tools to help address this issue. Um, we can assess microbial processes in soil amendments, uh, such as biosolids, and use DNA barcoding to develop biodiversity targets post mine closure. And just to put a uh, plug in, uh, at TRU we are supporting the BC Center for Ecosystem Reclamation, which will have partners including uh, UBC Okanagan, UNBC, SFU, and multiple industry partners. And uh, these are the funding supporters, and I thank you very much for your time. <laughs>